Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 49 in chronological order if you are following along at home, which you should be, with our returning guest slash sparring partner, Dorolo Nixon, Esquire. And today we will be covering, uh, for Black History Month, W.E.B. Du Bois's seminal book, The Souls of Black Folk. I have the Barnes and Noble Classics edition in my hand here, and uh, uh, so does our uh, so does Dorolo today. He's got uh, he's got his edition. Mine's uh, he has Penguin Classics. Mine. He has, he has the Penguin Classics edition. Awesome. And so we are going to talk about um, the writing of W. E. B. Du Bois, particularly focused around um, the tension between himself and Booker T. Washington, as we covered up from slavery um, already in a previous episode of this podcast this month. We're also going to discuss a little bit about the literary life of W.E.B. Du Bois. And as usual, we are going to get into what his writing actually means for leaders of all races in this multicultural, multi-ethnic and multiracial country that we exist in today. And I quote from <clears throat> The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois from the chapter of the Dawn of Freedom. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa, in America and the islands of the sea. It was a, fra- it was a phase of this problem that caused the Civil War. And however much they who marched south and north in 1861 may have fixed on the technical points of union and local autonomy as a shibboleth, all nevertheless knew, as we know, that the question of Negro slavery was the real cause of the conflict. Curious it was, too, how this deeper question ever forced itself to the surface despite effort and disclaimer. No sooner had northern armies touched southern soil than this old question newly guised sprang from the earth, what shall be done with Negroes? Preemptory military commands this way and that could not answer the query. The Emancipation Proclamation seemed but to broaden and intensify the difficulties, and the war amendments made the Negro problems of today. It is the aim of this essay to study the period of history from 1861 to 1872 so far as it relates to the American Negro. In effect, this tale of the dawn of freedom is an account of that government of men called the Freedmen's Bureau, one of the most singular and interesting of the attempts made by a great nation to grapple with vast problems of race and social condition. The war has not to do with slaves, cried Congress, the president and the nation, yet no sooner had the armies east and west penetrated Virginia and Tennessee than fugitive slaves appeared within their lines. They came at night. When the flickering campfires shone like vastly unsteady stars along the black horizon, old men and thin with gray and tuft hair, women with frightened eyes dragging whimpering hungry children, men and girls stalwart and gaunt, a horde of starving vagabonds, homeless, helpless, and pitiable in their dark distress. Two methods of treating these newcomers seemed equally logical to opposite sorts of minds. Ben Butler in Virginia quickly declared, quickly declared slave property contraband of war and put the fugitives to work, while Fremont in Missouri, declared the slaves free under martial law. Butler's action was approved, but Fremont's was hastily countermanded, and his successor, Halleck, saw things differently. Hereafter, he commanded, no slaves should be allowed to come into your lines at all. If any come without your knowledge, when owners call for them, deliver them. Such a policy was difficult to enforce. Some of the Black refugees declared themselves free men. 
Others showed that their masters had deserted them and still others were captured with forts and plantations. Evidently, too, slaves were a source of strength to the Confederacy and were being used as laborers and producers. <clears throat> they constitute a military resource, wrote Secretary Cameron late in 1861, and being such that they should not be turned over to the enemy is too plain to discuss. So gradually, the tone of the army chiefs changed. Congress forbade the rendition of fugitives, and Butler's contrabands were welcomed as military laborers. This complicated rather than solved the problem, for now the scattering fugitives became a steady stream, which flowed faster as the armies marched. Then, the long-headed man with the care-chiseled face who sat in the White House saw the inevitable and emancipated the slaves of rebels on New Year's 1863. <clears throat> a month later, Congress called earnestly for the Negro soldiers whom the Act of July 1862 had half-grudgingly allowed to enlist. Thus, the barriers were leveled and the deed was done. The stream of fugitives swelled to a flood, and anxious army officers kept inquiring, what must be done with slaves arriving almost daily? Are we to find food and shelter for women and children? William Edward Bernhard Dubois, born 1868 to 1963, yes, the man lived almost an entire century, was an American sociologist, socialist, historian, and pan-Africanist civil rights activist, according to his Wikipedia bio. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, Dubois grew up in a relatively tolerant and integrated community. As a matter of fact, he was one of the few folks, one of the few freed Blacks in that community, and he is his family owned land <clears throat> going back on his mother's side several generations. <clears throat> Pardon me. After completing graduate work at the University of Berlin and Harvard University, where he was the first African American to earn a doctorate, he became a professor of history, sociology, and economics at Atlanta University. Dubois was one of the founders of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in 1909, an organization to which my grandmother and everyone in her generation gave to, well, gave to generously. Indeed. His collection of essays, The Souls of Black Folk, is a seminal work in African-American literature, and his 1935 magnum opus, Black Reconstruction in America, challenged the prevailing orthodoxy that Blacks were responsible for the failures of the Reconstruction era. Borrowing a phrase from Frederick Douglass, he popularized the use of the term color line to represent the injustice of the separate but equal doctrine prevalent in American social and political life. By the way, pause here on the Wikipedia notes. Um, my mother agreed with separate but equal. Wow. Okay. So did several. As she was not alone in her generation. We'll talk a little bit about that today as well. Hmm. He, uh, he opens the souls of Black folk, as we just read, with the central thesis <clears throat> of much of his life's work and pursuits. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Now, mm -hmm. we cannot let this all go by because we do live in an era of retconning history and CRT madness. And so I'm not going to let this go by. He was a Marxist radical. Let's be real as well as highly anti-war, both anti-nuclear and anti-World War II. He was not in favor of the United States going to World War II. He thought mm. we could do a deal with Hitler. Uh, maybe he thought we had enough problems in America that, uh, hey, we just leave those, uh, those goose-stepping guys over there. Maybe they'll sort out their problem over there. Um, to me, it seems... Uh, to demonstrate just a want of judgment um, about the nature of the Nazi evil um, in several senses. One, uh, the belief that it could be could have been contained. Hey, we'll do a deal and you'll stay over there. Charles Lindbergh thought the same thing. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, so a bunch of people did. So but... A lot of guys, right? Exactly. So did a lot of people back in the day. A lot of yeah, people maybe Joseph day. P. Kennedy Senior did as well. You know. 
right. uh, in the beginning. But um, that's only one of the misjudgments. Um, it's also the, the, I think, the ideas that the Nazis stood for posed more of a danger even than their arms and their armies, because if a deal were done, well, how much time would a non-fascist America, and I say that in quote, that's in quotation marks, non-fascist America, air quotes or whatever they're called now, um, how long a non-fascist America could continue to function before similar ideas brought themselves to the fore in the United States um, and then began to make themselves forcefully felt because that's how fascism works. At the same time, of course, um, there was a well-known experiment in fascism in America running in the South at the time uh, with respect to black people as there had been for a long time. And so um, it's just, to me, it shows that Du Bois wasn't properly perceiving that, hey, this is another front in the same war you're actually fighting. You well, know, you're fighting for the dignity of man, irrespective of what he or she looks like. Great. So deal with this problem over here, you know? Well, and there was also very little pushback, at least none that I could find, although perhaps there is in some of his writing that was extant to his books, uh, perhaps opinion pieces, um, perhaps periodical literature. Uh, uh, but I'm not aware of W.E.B. Du Bois ever speaking out loudly or vociferously about Japanese people being interned in camps in the United States under the Roosevelt administration during the war itself. Mm -hmm. One other thought before I sort of speed the floor a little bit here to Mr. Nixon, um, as well as being a Marxist rat, well, not as well as, in, in, <clears throat> because of this Marxist radicalism, mm -hmm. um, Dubois sparred quite publicly, starting with Booker T. Washington, um, but going all the way to folks in the arts like uh, Zora Neale Hurston and others who maybe took the opposite view from Dubois, who maybe believed that there might be a way to make a separate peace with the white man on this continent that we're all trapped on, that there is no back to Africa, that this is the Alamo if you're black and your back is up against the wall, at least in the 20th century. And the only way out, and this is one of the, actually the chapters in Up From Slavery, the only way out is up. <laughs> well, you know. Welcome um, to my friend Dorolo Nixon. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Somebody wiser than me uh, was telling me recently, no, 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 it can always get worse. <laughs> and so um, the, the amount of dispossession and decimation that um, the indigenous tribes faced in America, um, in large parts of America, um, I would argue that that was worse. Uh, and I do argue that that was worse. Um, I also point out that it wasn't uniform. Um, I happen to live in Arizona. Arizona is the state that has the largest amount of land uh, still owned by indigenous tribes. Um, it's possible Alaska is an exception. I don't actually believe so. I think that's mostly federal. But for indigenous tribes, Arizona's state numero uno, um, in terms of our population, the percentage of the population that is indigenous, if I'm not mistaken, is around 22 or 23 percent. We should also lead the nation in that. Um, and just to give you perspective, since we're talking, since this is two black guys talking about black people, um, there is perhaps it's somewhere between two to three times as many native people. Uh, Native American people uh, living in Arizona than Black people. Um, be that as it may, um, you know, uh, not not that you know, I would would have wished us to go down that route, um, but meaning the route of dispossession and decimation. But I just think it's prudent to point out that hey, Booker T, it can it can get worse. <laughs> well, you know, and it was worse in the pale, in my wife's native country, you know, Ukraine, it was worse for Jews in the pale in this narrow amount of time and during the same time frame when that's what they were facing was just decimation. And it was just like, okay, you know, it was bad. And 
change needed to happen. It was bad and they needed to go in a different direction and they did. And we have these two views about which, how to go about that. I think both of those eminent, you know, African-American men said, look, um, the, the status quo is not tenable. Here's the goal. Let's go about it. And, you know, they argued about, I think they really argued about um, methodology more than the actual goal. And I think the, 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 the personalities and the philosophies of these two men, uh, their experiences, yes, but it turned out Du Bois actually did have some experience with, not with slavery, but with the segregated South, um, because he did, he did school at Fisk University in Tennessee. Um, so he got to see Jim Crow up close. He was not someone who stayed ensconced in his liberal, you know, West Anglia, <laughs> which is what I'm going to call um, New England, West Anglia. Anglia, England. okay. Um, hmm. yeah. you know, he didn't just stay there to his credit, um, but un unlike certain liberal intellectuals today, he didn't just stay in his towers, right? Um, he left Harvard and went to, you know, Western Tennessee and then had to deal with what my ancestors from Tennessee were dealing with at that same time. So, uh, as well as, as, as well as my ancestors from, you know, Northern Ken or so yeah, Northern Kentucky and Southern Ohio, you know, um, okay. Oh, okay. Well, a couple of things there. So human beings and, and, and we're captured by this moment right now in our culture in America. And I would say that this moment has been going on for about the last maybe 10 or 15 years. Um, and I think it's gotten really sharp because of the internet and social media. This has driven mm -hmm. this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, people have always believed that they are better than whoever came before them in the historical past. That's the first arrogance and the first hubris. Correct. The second hubris is that not only are we better because we know more, but if we were to go back in time, we would make different decisions because we are somehow more knowledgeable. We are now sharply in the grasp of this spirit right now. This is the spirit of our age. It is an age. It is a spirit of hubris and of arrogance. And yeah, I'm going to go on record early um, here on the podcast, and I'm going to name a name, and I don't care. Uh, you know, Ibrahim X. Kendi, Robin D'Angelo, she's white, um, but all these self-flagellating white people and these self-flagellating black people, these liberal intellectuals, and yes, I did say liberal, and I'm going to go for the progressive <laughs> liberal intellectuals who are running around proclaiming the evilness of America at a systemic level seem to lack historical perspective, number one. Number two, they seem to lack humility. And by the way, you can come for me all you want about me not being, me being self-hating or, or, or what is it, imbibing anti-Blackness in the way that Dorello is drinking his water right now. I have not imbibed anti-Blackness. As a matter of fact, I, I'm going to say I'm more Black than you. If we're going to have a, black, a race to Blackness, <laughs> a race to define blackness, which is again, the tension between W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington is, is, is really a tension of how do you define blackness? Uh, when I was a kid, uh, you know, the phraseology in the 90s was, uh, uh, you know, you're not black enough. You ain't black enough to play this game or you ain't black enough to do this and you ain't black enough to do that. I never really knew what the hell that meant. That always sounded nonsense to me. And we are, we are trapped right now as Black Americans, I think. And, and I'm not talking about the average Black person who goes to like work on a daily basis and is trying to live their life. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the people that suck up all the air on social media, that tweet constantly, and that are driving the intellectual direction of Black America right now. I'm talking about the people who run the 16, that woman who's running the 1619 Project. That garbage. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about because that's what, that's what leads us into this perpetual state of being always the consciousness of America and never really fully moving into being free men in America who just make decisions. Like we just, we just never get to move into there. And a lot of this started with W.B. Du Bois. By the way, a person who was not a slave, did not come from a slave background. I mean, up from slavery starts... And we again, we read this on our podcast. You can go back and listen to it. But like Booker T. Washington literally opens up <laughs> up from slavery with the line, I was born a slave on a plantation in Franklin County, Virginia. Mm -hmm. I am not quite sure of the exact place or exact date of my birth. But at any rate, I suspect I must have been born somewhere at some time. Nothing mm -hmm. beats direct experience. 
nothing beats that. So, you know, we're going to cover Dubois essay where he rails against Mr. Washington. Um, but I think that this strain, this thread has come down in black, in black, in black culture in America. And it's, I think it's time to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. That's my large thesis of today. I think it's time to get rid of it. I think it's time to abandon it. Um, but we can't do that, of course, without addressing the past. Mm -hmm. um, on the Indian assertion that you had, the Native mm -hmm. American assertion, mm -hmm. um, what responsibility do you think Black Americans have to the Native American population? So it's, it's interesting because um, even before um, the popularization of um, the analysis of DNA, mm -hmm. okay, to determine the origin of uh, someone's ancestors, even before the popularity of that as a commercial business, it's low price, frankly, it's retail prices, okay, because there's more than one service out there, I'll, I'll quote a couple, mm -hmm. Ancestry.com has one and 23andMe. Dot com. They, these are two competing companies who um, use algorithms and genetic uh, samples from various peoples all over the world, and they use matching to show, okay, these, this is, you know, these are the, the populaces to which your DNA bears um, some similarity or, frankly, sometimes matches, okay? Um, anyway, um, even before the popularity of this pursuit, let's say, this social pursuit, okay, to determine the genetic origins of one's person, the notion that an African-American is really someone descended from three different races, that already existed, okay? I believe it was the great American author, Zora Neale Hurston, who famously took to task some Black people by saying, if I'm not mistaken, she said something like, and she's the only one whose great grandmother was not an Indian chief or something like that. Okay. Um, but basically the basic notion that African-Americans like you and I mm -hmm. consist of people whose DNA largely has an African origin, narrowly has some European origin, but even more narrowly contains DNA from indigenous peoples. Uh, I think it's pretty well demonstrated. Uh, a simple Google search uh, and asking, for example, what portion of African Americans have at least 1% uh, DNA from an indigenous tribe would, would yield some answer. I'm certain someone has done a study on this and I've spent way too much time and my wife would tell you way too much money on things like this. But anyway, um, that has relevance in this context because, uh, and I'm not the only bit, so let me, let me go a little bit deeper. That is the case in for my DNA, it, it falls into those three general categories. Mm -hmm. um, and during this research, I learned things like, oh, the state of South Carolina, where my father's mother was from and her people are from and where the strongest amount of indigenous American DNA was that entered my own DNA and thus also the DNA of my children, um, that that was the state in which uh, indigenous Americans were most trafficked into slavery. So it is fitting that that would be where that DNA would come into, uh, to come to join the story. Those people would come to join the story, as it were, um, of the ancestors who make up the role in Exigen. Anyway, um, that has relevance because from a certain point of view, we're not talking about peoples who are completely alien. We're talking about peoples who are related to us, uh, related to us genetically, then related to us by condition of exclusion or oppression from mainstream American society. And for me, that has an end date, okay? So I'm speaking of 300 years ago. Um, there are people out there who would say that 30 years ago, that was still true. I happen not to be one of those people, but I do from a certain perspective, understand where they're coming from. But I think if we back up 300 years, there's far less disagreement uh, against that notion. And so for me, the relatedness is not really genetic, it's a relatedness of condition, a condition where uh, those persons were subject to arbitrary interference or violence or removal or what have you. And depending on the location, there could be some recourse or no recourse. Um, but it was a it was a condition. And so I think that having shared that condition, as it were, and being descended from peoples who share that condition today, 
Um, I think there ought to be at a minimum some cut, some type of sympathy. Um, but one of my major bugbears in contemporary analysis and discourse about indigenous American tribes is how they are viewed as a monolith. I don't like monoliths. I started, so a monolith is a massive stone, right? Uh, and a massive single stone. Think of Stonehenge, think of other megalithic circles. Megalith is another use of the same. I believe it's, it's Greek, lithos, lithos for stone, which I didn't learn in classics class at Cornell. I learned from Raiders of the Lost Ark because that's how that starts with the girl and I love yeah. you on her eyes. Right. He yes. was talking about Neolithic, Neolithic, yes. and Lithos is stone. Right. So megalithic, massive stone. Okay, great stone, actually. Um monolith single stone okay the notion that black people are one massive stone thus everyone is the same we are faceless nameless just entity or problem that has to be dealt with i have a problem in quotation marks you can't see my face uh anyway um it's something i've, I've been railing against since probably since before middle school um maybe not railing railing from middle school but before middle school is where I started to just have this discomfort because I think it's a fair generalization to say that regardless of the person you're dealing with, whether it's Mr. Washington, uh, George, Mr. Washington, Booker, Mr. Du Bois, or Mr. Sorrells, or myself, I think you have to look at the geography of where the person was born and raised, the time frame in which he or she was born and raised, and certain other personal factors, and it gives you a large insight to where they're coming from politically uh, and socially, or sociologically, perhaps, okay? So, um, yeah, so... The, the now we're dealing with a monolithic notion of indigenous tribes, that they were all unjustly treated, that the, the, the phrase is our land was stolen. Um, well, whose land? And I'm not challenging the notion of land and its fungibility, okay? I think that that is actually one of the most profound stabilizing and wealth generating innovations that man has ever done, okay? It's literally right out there with the wheel. And thus, it is not surprising to me that in the societies that developed those ideas first, when they added to it notions of um, rule of law and fair play, all of a sudden, the, 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 the architecture of freedom that we now enjoy was possible. It was not possible before that. Anyway, it was so important that voting used to be tied to ownership of land. And so back to the, the statement, you know, you stole our land, whoever you is. Our land was stolen, whoever we are, right? And then, you know, give us back our land. That's the, the most, um, well, give us our land back now would be the most forthright assertion in that regard. And I say, okay, but whose land? Let's look at some details. So this won't take super long. Um, this is not scripted. <laughs> this won't take super long. No, this is, this is, this is not scripted. By the way, your audio is not. By the Falls way, Durello. Delaware. Durello. Basically, one of the oldest Algonquin tribes. Your is, audio is a little, yeah, your audio is a little tinny. Oh, I'm using my hands probably to gesture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the Lenny Lenape, the, you know, also called the Delaware people, um, who were one of the most eminent of the Algonquin or Algonquian tribes. So this is roughly the Northeast of the United States. Uh, it's, it's, it's a language family, first of all. So basically, if you're looking at the northeastern part of the United States, um, 300 years ago, you could divide the tribes into two language families, the Iroquoian, which of course obviously included the Iroquois Confederacy in my native New York, and also the Algonquin tribes, which had inhabited New England, and largely by, you know, by 300 years ago, which is 1723, um, where you could displace or wiped out in New England with certain pockets, you know, and certain exceptions, but still would include people in Pennsylvania and certainly Western Pennsylvania. Anyway, um, one of the best known trees with the Native tribe prior to 1776 relates to, uh, it was, I believe it was uh, Senator Friedlinghausen or Governor Friedlinghausen from New Jersey. It's obviously a Dutch name, and that was some of New Jersey settlement for the English. Anyway, did a 
treaty with the Lenape, and the Lenape, the Lenape agreed to remove to Pennsylvania. They agreed to remove across the Delaware River, there comes that name again, okay, to the eastern, sorry, to the western shore, that's eastern Pennsylvania, and it was to make room for settlement, but it was a, it was a treaty. So that was the loss of land by tree, not by theft. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at a different example that I'm currently working through in some, some of what I'm working on. And I know this will come up later about Mr. Du Bois because it's a perspective and a, and a not really a bias, it's a bent. It's a, it's a shape that he and I shared, which is to, to front load the culture and the arts and things like that over the mechanical. Um, anyway, um, so the Comanche, whom I'm reading about, because, well, um, I may get into that later, but basically I'm studying them. So Comancheria, which included where you happen to be seated right now, Mr. Sorrell, uh, and thousands of other square miles, um, the Comanches came to dominate late, so that meant, for example, 300 years ago, they were not there, okay? So we're not talking, hey, we've been here for thousands of years. The Comanche were not in the northern or central or southern Great Plains a thousand years ago. They weren't there. It's a fact, period. Next, they came to dominate it by force. And part of the issue with forceful domination is you always open a back door that says, because I've displaced somebody, therefore, if someone comes to displace me, I don't have any grounds to complain about it. And so to the extent that they were then subsequently displaced uh, and removed, no, removed is too strong, to the extent that their control over the Great Plains was broken by a new power, i.e. that of the United States of America, um, the Comanches specifically, I don't think they have much of a leg to stand on and saying, we'll give us this back. Why? You took it from people less than 300 years ago. And you lost it in roughly in about 100 years. So why should that go back to you? Now, we can contrast them with like the Zuni or the Pueblo dwellers, including in my state, but also next door in Mexico. They have really strong land claims. Okay. They were literally there for potentially thousands of years. Uh, peaceful, agrarian. Okay. And so they make one of the best arguments to the injustices that were done by the United States government. And I'm not saying there weren't. I'm just saying that this is not a monolith, okay? Um, and part of that analysis is necessary, but I'm also, and, I, I, and then I'm gonna stop making this point. I think it's important to delve deep enough to hit some moral bedrock, like, well, if somebody shows up in a place and starts cultivating and developing it, there's a certain point after which I think their claim is pretty good. And at the same time, um, where somebody only took over something by violence, um, if somebody comes to displace them by violence, I don't think they have much of a leg to stand. Um, to, it's, it's not exactly quid pro quo as much as um, the measure with which you measure, that's how it'll be measured back to you. Right. So yeah. two guys talk about that, talked about that. Um, Thomas Jefferson was one, and the great... U.S. President Abraham Lincoln was another whose birthday was yesterday, which I'd be remiss not to mention. Um, I believe it was his 114th anniversary, no, 214th anniversary of his birth, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, but he talked about it in his second inaugural, which I read yesterday. Um, some notions of this, um, the idea that um, if you believe God is just, do you really want to go to him and ask for justice when here's your record of behavior? And all nations should engage in that kind of analysis, including the United States of America. All right. So we're going to we're going to get into that in a little bit. But Mr. Nixon's going to prepare his audio because he's a little bit tinny right now. Uh -oh. Again? <laughs> so he's going to repair his audio. And I'm going to consume some time while he's doing that. Excellent points made all, by the way, um, in regards to the Native American question, um, the issue of claims, um, the issue of who has claim and who does not, uh, what does claim look like, 
uh, the challenge of genealogy in a multicultural, multifaceted, and multiracial country like America, a nation built not on uh, a genealogical or even a land claim, a nation built on a creed, a nation built on the idea that, well, you can come here and be free. By the way, these are ideas that we explored in both the Federalist Papers, episode number 26, um, and the Anti-Federalist Papers, episode number 29, also with Dorello Nixon. I would encourage you to go back and listen to both of those podcasts, but in case you don't want to, I've got a little selection here from the Federalist, from the Anti-Federalist Papers, uh, some of the arguments that went on uh, during the uh, Constitutional Convention covering, well, this sticky issue of slavery. And so I quote from the Anti-Federalist Papers, edited with an introduction by Ralph Ketchum um, on slavery and the Constitution, uh, August 21st and 22nd, these arguments were made. Um, and so you're going to want to go back and read those. And uh, they, the, the gentleman did go back and forth uh, between Mr. Martin, Mr. Rutledge, uh, Mr. Ellsworth, Mr. Pinky, Sherman, Colonel Mason. We're going to I want to pull from all of their language because I do think that it's relevant um, as a background to our uh, to our conversation. And so I want to quote from Mr. L. Martin directly from the Federalist Papers. Uh, Mr. Martin proposed to vary the Section 4, Article 7, so as to allow a prohibition or tax on the importation of slaves and to have as five slaves are to be counted as three men in the apportionment of representatives, such a clause would leave an encouragement to this traffic. He argued that slaves weakened one part of the union, which the other parts were bound to protect. The privilege of importing them was therefore unreasonable. It was inconsistent with the principles of the revolution and dishonorable to the American character to have such a feature in the Constitution. Mr. Rutledge, however, did not see how the importation of slaves could be encouraged by this section. He was not apprehensive of insurrections and would readily exempt the other states from the obligation to protect the Southern against them. Religion and humanity had nothing to do with this question. Interest alone is the governing principle with nations. The true question at present is whether the Southern states shall or shall not be parties to the Union. If the Northern states consult their interest, they will not oppose the increase of slaves, which will increase the commodities of which they will become the carriers. Mr. Ellsworth, on the other hand, was for leaving the clause as it stands. State, let every state import what it pleases. The morality or wisdom of slavery are considerations belonging to the states themselves. What enriches a part enriches the whole, and the states are the best judges of their particular interest. The old confederation had not meddled with this point, and he did not see any greater necessity for bringing it within the policy of the new one. Whereas Mr. Pinky from South Carolina mentioned, to Dorolo's point, South Carolina can never receive the plan if it prohibits the slave trade. In every proposed extension of the powers of Congress, the state has expressly and watchfully accepted that of meddling with the importation of Negroes. By the way, by this point, just a side note, they had moved on from the native tribes. If the states be at all left at liberty on this subject, South Carolina may perhaps by degrees do of herself what is wished, as Virginia and Maryland have already done. Mr. Sherman then countered with this point. He was for leaving the clause as it stands. He disapproved of the slave trade, yet as the states were now possessed of the right to import slaves, as the public good did not require it to be taken from them, and as it was expedient to have as few objections as possible to the proposed scheme of government, he thought it best to leave the matter as we find it. He observed that the abolition of slavery seemed to be going on in the United States, and that the good sense of the several states would probably by degrees complete it. He urged on the convention the necessity of dispatching its business. And finally, Colonel Mason had the last word during these discussions on August 21st and 22nd. This infernal traffic originated in the avarice of British merchants. The British government constantly checked the attempts of Virginia to put a stop to it. The present question concerns not the importing states alone, but the whole union. The evil of having slaves was experienced during the late war. Had slaves been treated as they might have been by the enemy, they would have proved dangerous instruments in their hands. Two, W.E.B. Du Bois' point. But their folly dealt by the slaves as it did by the Tories. 
He mentioned the dangerous insurrections of the slaves in Greece and Sicily. (laughs) and the instructions given by Cromwell to the commissars sent to Virginia to arm the servants and slaves in case other means of obtaining a submission should fail. Maryland and Virginia, he said, had already prohibited the importation of slaves expressly. North Carolina had done the same in substance. All this would be in vain if South Carolina and Georgia be at liberty to import. The Western people are already calling out for slaves in their new lands. Pause once again. The West, meaning Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio, those places, and will fill that country with slaves if they can be got through South Carolina and Georgia. Slavery discourages arts and manufacturers. The poor despise labor when performed by slaves. They prevent the immigration of whites who really enrich and strengthen a country. They produce the most pernicious effect on manners. Every master of slaves is born a petty tyrant. They bring the judgment of heaven on a country. As nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence punishes national sins by national calamities. He lamented that some of our Eastern brethren had from lust of gain embarked in this nefarious traffic. As to the states being in possession of the right to import, this was the case with many other rights now to be properly given up. He held it essential at every point of view that the general government should have the power to prevent the increase of slavery. I believe Colonel Mason probably would have been a fellow traveler with W.E.B. Dubois. He, he might, might if he would have sat in the same room with him. No, but, you know, hey, one inch at a time, right? Um, no, <laughs> not to do voices to do voices point. No, give me the whole 26.2 miles now. Um, you know, well, and, well, speaking of, um, well, speaking of this, so, so this gets to something that we discussed on the podcast. And again, your audio is still a little bit, a little bit tinny there. Do you want to pause and you want to, you want to go back out and come back in? Why don't you go back out and come back in? We'll, we'll leave this in. It makes it sound real. <laughs> he's going to go back out. He's going to come back in. While he's going back out and while he's coming back in, I would like to take this moment on the podcast to thank you for listening to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast. Uh, We've been on well over 100 episodes. Uh, We have two formats, our shorts episodes, which are uh, two to six minute long ideas, thoughts, or rants about the psychology, the philosophy, and even the theology of leadership. And then, of course, we have our longer format pieces uh, featuring myself and a guest, uh, sometimes our guest co-host, uh, our yes, our guest co-host uh, Tom Libby, uh, uh, out of uh, out of Boston, and occasionally uh, DeRolo Nixon and many others. So I would encourage you to continue to listen to the podcast, and I thank you for your ears. Mr. Nixon is back. He's doing an it's audio better. check. That is significantly better. Yes, excellent. Yes, you don't sound like you're down a tube somewhere. So I want to get into this. So this now sets up this idea that Dubois is going to focus on. Um, And Mason hits on it. And so does Dubois in his essay on uh, Booker T, of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others. Um, Now, I'm not going to read directly from this quite just yet, but I will say one of the things in Dubois's essay there, one of his main knocks against Booker T. Washington is that to Colonel Mason's point, and, and, and you even mentioned this, Dubois wanted to front load culture and Booker T. Washington wanted to front load thrift. He wanted to front load character. Character mm-hmm. before the vote, I think, would probably be Booker T. Washington's position. And W.B. Dubois, W.B. Dubois' position was the vote before anything else. Mm-hmm. Suffrage above all else. Mm-hmm. Um. Huh. In looking at the modern Black American culture, mm-hmm. where Black American men are more likely to be incarcerated, I think it's somewhere like four to five times more likely to be incarcerated than men of any other race. Mm-hmm. 
where young black boys um, consistently perform in educational attainment behind young black girls, mm -hmm. where young black girls outstrip um, when they get to college, outstrip in degree um, acquisition black men by a factor of, I believe it's now up to three to one. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. an obscene level of distance. It's almost uncoverable mm -hmm. where the single mother phenomenon, and I'm not talking about Ronald Reagan's welfare queens. I'm talking about the fact of single parent households led by women in the African-American community is more mm -hmm. than any other race in America. Mm -hmm. When we are talking about the socioeconomic facts on the ground that are undeniable and in front of our eyes, mm -hmm. and where the culture that African Americans in this country, Black Americans in this country has produced, um, increasingly seems to, and I'm going to borrow some of Glenn Lowry's terms here, increasingly seems to codify sexual and immoral behavior that does not reflect a good character, instead reflects a poor character, mm -hmm. I think W.B. Du Bois lost the argument. Sure, you can have the vote, but if you're, twerp, if, you're, if you're twerking and shaking your behind and having kids out of wedlock, to what end? I think W.B. Du Bois had a lot more faith in the ability of members of his race and his generation, and this is where we get into separate but equal, members of his race and his generation to move the argument on culture forward. But he did not foresee the fact that suffrage does not bring character. It's not the same thing. What brings character is, to Booker T. Washington's point, work and thrift and particularly industry, uh, doing hard work. Uh, one of the things that I noted in Up, of Slave, Up From Slavery um, Booker T. Washington would note that when he went around um, uh, Tuskegee, Alabama, he, he observed an individual, a young African-American individual, uh, sitting in the dirt in filth. And actually, W.B. Du Bois brings up this point, sitting in the dirt in filth, reading a book of French grammar. Mm -hmm. He did bring up the point, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, uh, you've got to put the things... My mama always said, you got to put things in the right order. <laughs> There's an order to things for a reason. Um, you finish high school. You get a job. Doesn't matter what kind of job, just pick something. Hold on to that job. Date one woman, one time, marry her and stay married to her for the rest of your life. Like we know that these are the things that lead to economic success. These are the things that lead to, to your point, the acquisition of property, which allows for the anchoring of civic suffrage. My question here is, how is it that African-Americans, not as, and I'm not talking about, again, the average person walking around, I'm talking about African-American leadership. How is it that African-American leadership failed so spectacularly in the 20th century to merge these two ideas together? And that's, see, that's, that's the crux, no pun, of the issue. Why couldn't they have been merged together? Because I understand where Washington was coming from with respect to prioritizing economic gain and advancement. Um, I understand um, putting that in the forefront. Um, mm -hmm. I don't understand at the same time giving up political enfranchisement. And I don't think that you had to do that in order to gain the economic advancement. I mean, frankly, let's look at the track record uh, that it, the advancement didn't come and the rights, not so much were they given up, but they were sacrificed. And in part, they were stabbed in the back. Um, African-Americans were stabbed in the back, certainly in the last uh, certainly lastly, you know, by federal institutions that were, that had the clearest mandate to be in function in a colorblind fashion uh, and just chose not to, chose to well, franchise well, separately. Well, the, well, and this started with the Freedmen's Bureau. This started with the Freedmen's Bureau. One of the, one of the, one of the, one of the more, and I, I, I remembered reading about the, the Freedmen's Bureau, but I hadn't remembered all of it totally, completely to your point about the federal government. But 
this, and we're going to talk about reparations. This is my lead into reparations. The Freedmen's Bureau, there's a line to be drawn from the Freedmen's Bureau to the current discussion of reparations in California, mm -hmm. a state that was not a slave state mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet Gavin Newsom and his gubernatorial hair that want to run for president has created a task force that has proposed giving, granting compensation to, to the descendants of African-Americans in California, not the descendants, current African-Americans who were descended from people who were damaged in five areas, according to the New York Times article, which you can go out and look at. It was published uh, uh, in, De on De in December of 2022, so it's very recent. From 1933 to 1977, who were damaged in five key areas, housing, mass incarceration, unjust property seizures, uh, property seizures, sorry, devaluation of Black businesses and healthcare. And, and by the way, when you and I talked about reparations, I asked you what the number was, and I said it should be a dollar. <laughs> well, they've, they've come up with a number. We, we've, got, we've got a number now. California has given us a number, $569 billion or $223,200 per person. Wow. Talk about 40 acres and a mule from the Freedmen's Bureau. We're just back to recycling old history again. So don't let me, don't let me stop you. But like, that's the insert there, right? The federal government getting involved in this process that Booker T. Washington thought African-Americans had to bootstrap for themselves. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, there was a, when I tried to access it, there was a paywall. Um, that's oh. I think because their their AI or cookies or whatever just know me well enough to know. No, nope, <laughs> we're not letting you access anything for free. <laughs> Pay money. No thanks, New York Times. Oh, you can keep your narrative, New York Times. Um, well, I can, and I can read. I can read it from you. They they they, they have not gotten me yet. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> the AI cookies um, haven't gotten me yet. <laughs> So I was thinking about reparations yesterday because, um, oh, so let me back up. So in our, in our previous podcast, when we were talking about reparations, as I recall what I said, there are scenarios under which I can understand why reparations could be paid or even should be paid. Um, and it's a position for me that's evolved over time. It went from that's crazy to no, here's why it would be bad to, well, you know, there is some justice to the notion that, hey, you were damaged. Sorry, not you. You weren't there. Your third great grandfather was damaged by this as mine, Winslow Nixon was. OK. Um, and therefore, we're going to say here's the payment that should have been due them, him, excuse me. Here's the interest over all of that time. And here's a much larger sum of money. Here you go. Um, I can understand. Um, I can understand it being just. I can agree with that being just, frankly. Um, yet I can still see um, how in the larger context of how America is supposed to function, that that would be detrimental to the, the unity and the fabric of our, of our nation. Um, but here's what I was reading yesterday that made me think, that I wasn't the only person thinking about reparations. And of course, in that last conversation, I mentioned two, two points about reparations. One, that the British government effectively paid reparations to the descendants of former slave masters right. up through about 2015 or 2017. And for me, that was kind of a light bulb moment where I said, oh, so when the shoe was on the other foot, at least one government, and according to Thomas Jefferson, of all people, the government responsible <laughs> um, was willing to pay the other party for their loss of property. OK, so if we can agree in principle that contractually that made sense. Well, what about when we discover that the 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 not the collateral, but basically the consideration for that contract actually had a greater um, injustice done to not really it, but to him, her, they, etc., such that at a minimum similar compensation is due. But stats of the British, Twain talked about it, and, and actually Samuel Langhorne Clemens did find some random black person to pay, black man to pay reparations to, and he felt he had done his bit. But it was not he wasn't being cynical about it when he paid it. I think he was lamenting 
um, just a sad state of affairs, which is what happened in, you know, 19th century America um, in many places for black people. So here, here are Lincoln's words, okay? These were said on March 4, 1865. So this man was gonna be shot to death um, one month and 11 days later. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray. Oh, my bad, hold on. I may be reading in the wrong place. Um, there it is, I'm reading in the wrong place. One eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed generally over the union, to your point about California, but localized in the Southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest, period. That word peculiar seems to keep cropping up in federal jurisprudence about black people. Anyway, all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the union even by war, semicolon, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it, period. Back to your argument in the Anti-Federalist Papers. These statements were made 70 years later and they echo the points that those men were arguing. And so that's how important slavery was and how divisive it was and how the positions were set in concrete. Um, each side understood what it was fighting for and against. Neither party expected for the war, the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other, period. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces, semicolon. But let us judge not that we be not judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, semicolon. That of neither has been fully answered, period. The Almighty has his own purposes, period. Quote, woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Close internal quote. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope. Fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword as was said 3000 years ago so still it must be said the judgments of the lord are true and righteous altogether until all the wealth piled by the bonds by the bondmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. That piece points to reparations. Here is the link between the two. The notion that there was some account running that was tabulating all of the efforts that were unrequited in terms of specie, okay, on one side, and the need to either pay that out to the other person or to vitiate it or to, what is the word? Um, so it, it, I'm, I'm a New York lawyer uh, and practice in several courts there um, and of course in other parts of the country. Um, unjust enrichment is a common law equity, re equitable remedy where there's no technical contract, but the law will recognize that somebody took some actions, that those actions have a worth, and that the party that was enriched unjustly needs to disgorge, the actual term that we use, um, that benefit back to the party who did that work. Um, it existed, it existed for hundreds of years. Uh, and it will probably be used today in some lawsuit filed today in New York, because we're so litigious, but anyway. Um, that 
to me, that showed me that the the economics of that 250 year nightmare um, are something that should be considered seriously. Um, but again, remember, um, there are other ways of going about it. There are ways of going about it that do not work an in injury uh, or there are ways of going about it that don't work an in injury. There are also ways of going about it that work less of an injury to frankly, um, not innocent bystanders because they weren't there. One thread through Du Bois's writings is making distinctions between people who were actually slaves and got freed, people who were born to people who were not slaves. When he was born in 1860, what, sorry, when, when John Wilson was born in Little River, South Carolina in 1868, his parents were not slaves. If he had been born 10 years before, they would have been, but he was not born 10 years before. He was born a free people in 1868. They had been free, duh, past tense. So he was born a free man of free people. Um, du Bois carried those distinctions through his writings, at least in, in this work, in The Souls of Black Folk, published in 1903. Uh, he did, and I think that's a very important distinction because we are not dealing with people, we're not dealing with anyone who lived during that era. We're not dealing with anyone who met anyone who lived in that era almost ever, okay? The possibility still exists, yes. You could speak to a centenarian who had spoken to a centenarian. That person could have, would have been around during mm -hmm. slavery um, and could, could have been around during slavery if born in the South and raised in the South for the first 30 years, would have been you know, born and raised uh, while that institution existed. Okay, fine. Um, but um, obviously that's the statistical likelihood of that is, is, is almost, it's, a, it's, it's basically, it's, it's not statistically important, right? So, it so falls gonna, within the error percentage or less. So, so let me, let, so let yeah. me go back to this idea first, because yeah. we got jogged off on reparations a little bit. And I'm going to go back to that. I took a note because there's a, there's a point I want to make um about that counterpoint to that but the bigger point here or the bigger question here which was why is it why did why did why did african-american intellectuals fail to merge these two ideas together the yeah. booker t washington idea of thrift and the wb dubois idea of culture why did they fail to merge those two ideas together why did they fail to 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 pull those two tensions together and click them together mm -hmm. um I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X couldn't even get on the same page up until a few months before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And then Malcolm X had to go through his own uh, uh, hero's journey <laughs> away from the nation of Islam, away from mm -hmm. radical Eldritch Cleaver, soul on ice kind of thinking um, to basically be assassinated at the end of that. Um, and now we are left with individuals like, again, um, I'm going to name names here. We're left with Jesse Jackson, who was standing next to Martin Luther King Jr., pointing over that way when he got shot on the hotel balcony. We're left with Al Sharpton, a man who was a pimp and a race hustler. Yes, I said it out loud. Everybody knows it. We need to point this out. And Tawana Brawley and everything else, right? We are left with now grifters that are operating at a very high level, like the Ibrahim X. Kendi's of the world mm -hmm. and the Tahinasi Coates, who graduated from those elite institutions in the same way you did. You graduated from Cornell. In this, in this discussion, if we were to break it down based on education, hell, I graduated from Tuskegee. You graduated from Harvard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Like, we're, to, we're really, like, kind of break this down, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Why has there been such a monumental failure to link those two things together in African-American culture in the United States over the course of the last hundred years? Because I would assert that the, the challenge of the 20th century was not the color line. The mm -hmm. challenge of the 20th century was the linking of the, of the intellect and the character and the spirit to, 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 to thrift and industry. Mm -hmm. And they both sort of went like this. Mm -hmm. The people who marched in the South for freedom were led by a woman whose feet hurt because she showed up at a freaking janitor and a janitorial job every day. She was a freaking maid. Mm -hmm. Rosa mm -hmm. Parks' feet hurt. 
Mm-hmm. She wasn't some Harvard intellectual somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She don't have time for no, like, we got to get reparations. She had time to get her behind on a segregated bus. Mm-hmm. To get to work. Yep. To get and to, to get work home. And yep. to get home. Like, and there's then this- she decided, hey, um, I'm just not moving today. Just not moving today. Right. Like, like yeah. there, there's this, there's this lack of of linking these two things together, and I think that was the monumental failure of the 20th century. Mm-hmm. And I, well, I it, worry, it expose... I worry that we're going to make well, and I worry that we're we're, yeah. we're working down that we're going down the road of making this monumental failure again because in in nobody ever points this out, and I think I pointed it on the last podcast episode we did in 2020, the the candidate for president that earned more of the black male vote than any other candidate in history was Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The entire black female vote went to Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. There's a disconnect happening. Oh yeah. And I my concern is that disconnect if this drift continues mm-hmm. in when my six year old boy is mar- is of marriageable age, mm-hmm. there won't be a black woman interested in him. Mm-hmm. That graduated. There always that, will be. that graduated think, from Harvard. I think there always will be. Um. Maybe not have graduated from Harvard. And that's not to say that she won't be intelligent. That's to say that that institution molds its people in a certain way that she might leave and have different notions in her head um, than those she went into it with. Um, right. Now, arguably, if that's not the case, Harvard is failing to do what Harvard is supposed to do. Um, but that's because of my views about um, education, capital E, being character formation. Um, that's what we're held on the hook for by God, frankly. I'm well, a father also, as you are. What will we, well, we be held on the hook for? The well, characters. they've been captured by wokeness, though. Like, they've been captured mm-hmm. by woke. They, 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 Harvard, Cornell, Princeton, Rutgers. Harvard invented wokeness. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what? They're not going to give the money back. They ain't going to give the endowment back. No one's talking about that. <clears throat> so let's be real here, right. son. Free tuition, perhaps. But disgorgement of the endowment, probably not. Back um, to that word again, disgorgement. Yeah. There we go. Right. Yes, right. So, yes. so, so, why did why did why did the intellectual class and the working class fail to unite in the 20th century? <sighs> I mean, there's <laughs> petty little reasons, right? Right. But in terms of profound reasons, um, and I, I say this also as a man who's been a politician, you know, mm-hmm. um. It is shocking the degree to which people's political choices, and this is a political choice, okay? Mm -hmm. The choice between Booker T. Washington and what he represented and the choice between William Edward Burkhard Du Bois, sorry, Dr. William Edward Burkhard Du Bois, uh, you know, PhD Harvard, whatever year he got it, 1898, whatever it was. um, The choice between the two is a political choice. Um, And not just because it involved political rights, it's the nature of the choice, it's a political choice. And I, still remain shocked by the degree to which um, anger and animosity and hatred play a part in normal pedestrian mundane political decisions. That the reason someone is choosing one candidate is because they loathe the other candidate. Not because the candidate they're choosing they like, not because of the candidate they're choosing has more merit, not because the candidate that they're choosing has anything other than to not be that other person because they want to see that other person go down in flames. (laughs) <laughs> so that they can stand right. before the ashes and literally do a jig, okay? Because they are happy as a clam. That happens in politics more than I'm comfortable with, okay? Um, and we, Twitter with all of its issues, tip of the iceberg. The degree oh, yeah. to which we are, the degree to which the common public is exposed to that rancor, that animosity that loathing is small so here okay you have somebody making a choice i disagree with saying the voting rights and the civil rights don't matter as much as economic enfranchisement okay there's people those intellectuals loathed that choice loathed the man who represented that choice okay and so coming together to find common accord can't happen when you hate your interlocutor. It just can't happen um, and didn't happen. Um, so to me, those are among the biggest reasons that there are all of these emotions and the drama of it, okay? Um, and just an inability 
to both experience the pain of the injustice underlying that choice, recognizing the other person's choice, respecting the other person, even though you loathe their choice, uh, and then agreeing, well, we have to work together on common ground because we have to work together. We have to, two heads are better than one, uh, a cord of three strands is not easily broken, which I literally read in the Bible this morning. Uh, it's in Ecclesiastes 5, I believe. Anyway, point being, they would have been stronger together. Mm-hmm. King and X together, mm-hmm. totally different America, period. Mm-hmm. Okay. And thus there's on a different realm, a different plane. There's an interest in somebody who doesn't want to see that <laughs> separating the two. And they, you know, obviously didn't discourage that. They went two different ways. Okay, fine. Um, you know, but they would have, they would, they could have done more together. And so I don't think there's a real intellectual explanation or a logical explanation for why they couldn't just get along and work together and march together and eat together. That no, it's not because the the fact that they were two different religions has nothing to do with it. Um, you know, the fact that one guy had a brilliant you know, uh, PhD level education and the other man had the same thing without any of those degrees, fine. Okay. Um, that, that, that I, I don't think that they couldn't get together because of those reasons. I think it's because of the bitterness, the anger, the loathing, the pain, the bitterness, this evil cauldron of emotion Okay, and once you imbibe that poison, you're done. That's literally what happened to King. Why did King become a Marxist? Because my view is that he wasn't his whole career. Okay, when when you run into a wall of dumb, intractable racism, okay, dumb, ignorant, intractable racism of white people, of black people, of green people, of blue people, of red people, brown people, whatever people you wish, um, it breaks your heart. And the trick, the real, the real, this is the real question is how will you respond? Can you overcome that? And the only, the only way to overcome that is love, obviously. Um, and we who are Christ followers know this, okay? Um, that's the only way you're going to ever see progress with that wall coming down, okay? The walls of Jericho weren't going to be battered by any army. They weren't. God made them fall. They fell. Done. Um, But you have to maintain that faith, as it were, in this area. Um, And when you lose faith, when you drink that draft of bitterness, okay, and it starts to work its poison in you, you then look for another route, another route to what you're still going to call justice, but now it no longer is, okay? Um, And you can tell, in part, because they have to add a qualifier. Social justice and a social democrat, it, it, there, there, there is non, there, there, there is is fundamentally misrepresentatively absurd as the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea. That whole term, why are all those words there to fool the ignorant? Okay, so if it were actually justice, you don't need social it's justice. Giving a man what he deserves, giving a woman what he deserves. Sometimes what he deserves is good because he's done good. Sometimes what he deserves is evil because what he's done is evil. So um, they then start pursuing these other ancillary routes because what they want is not what Abraham Lincoln was talking about in his second inaugural address. What they want is something now rather than in the time of providence. And they also miss, for the record, so I left off a paragraph. The paragraph shows the way forward that this man would have walked in if he weren't cruelly assassinated a month later. With malice toward none, with charity for all. Stop. That means don't drink the chalice of bitterness. Resist drinking the chalice of bitterness. It's a poison cup. It's tempting. It's tempting because they're actual wounds. It's tempting because there's actual heartbreak. It's tempting because there was an actual injustice, okay? Don't drink that chalice because when the malice comes in, it's very, very, very hard for it to get out. With malice toward none, with charity for all, 
Oh, so the way forward is love. That's the word he was using, okay? Charity, that Jacobean English word used in the King James Version of the Bible, okay? To translate a Koine Greek word that meant love. So let's use love instead of charity because we don't even know how to interpret that anymore, okay? So with malice toward none, with love for all. Wow, that wasn't it. He didn't stop there. With firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Oh, so should people be made to work for free? No, so pay them. Next, should people, should law-abiding people in this country be able to vote? Yes, okay, so let's make sure that that happens and not bend over backwards to deny peculiar, distinct, discrete and insular portions of the population the right to vote. Let's stop doing that. Let's stop doing that. Um, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan. That's literally, that phrase is the foundation of what I do for a living. I'm an accredited VA disability attorney. That phrase by President Lincoln is the foundation of what we do, period. Um, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. That's the end of his inaugural. It's one of the most powerful and profound pieces of American rhetoric, okay? And here in this context, it addresses the issues that these men were fighting over and, and, and arguing about and justly arguing about, okay? Each had his perspective, but, you know, I still come down on the Du Bois side and I doubt at that time, and it's in part because it's in the intro to the book that I read, that the bitterness had taken hold of him in the way that it would and then fuel the directions in which he went. And similar with King, I think when, when they maintain their vision and their faith, they could bear a lot more of the burden. But once they, once they, they drank that chalice, it was done because then, okay, so how do we get this now? And I don't care whose rights we have to trammel with what power, because we want this now. And it's just what, what, what disturbs me when I look towards the future. I think about my sons and the women they would marry and grandchildren of mine they would have, you know, the legions and legions of grandchildren they would have and will have, God willing. Um, you know, it's just we have to be able to get the country to return to the fundamentals that made this republic great. And that can be done, I trust, and I hope, and I pray, um, but it, it has to be done. And neither of these routes that these men took would get us there. Merging of the two, I think, would produce greater impact, right, to get there. Um, and it's just, you know, it behooves us to be those people who won't say from I'll speak from my perspective, but it, it behooves me as a black public intellectual to say, I need to work with the people who are trying a different route to get to the same end. They, like I, want to see whole and stable black families that are self-supporting and economically independent. They, like I, may also want to see white families, same way. Green families, same way. Blue families, same way. Pick another color family, same way. That, that's what I want. Um, as a conservative, I know that we can all have the same political rights and we can have different economic positions because we make different choices. Or we can all have <laughs> the same economic position, a miserably poor one, and have no political rights. And those are the two choices. And so I can see clearly where Marxism went and so it's even harder than to hoodwink me on where it could go because I see where it went. To your point, from the souls of black folk, a W.E.B. Dubois of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others. 
I'm going to read a couple of pages here. Then came the revolution of 1876, the suppression of the Negro votes, the changing and shifting of ideals and the seeking of new lights in the great night. Douglas, meaning Frederick Douglass, in his old age still bravely stood for the ideals of his early manhood, ultimate assimilation through self-assertion and on no other terms. For a time, Price arose as a new leader, destined to seem not to give up, but to restate the old ideals in a form less repugnant to the white South, but he passed away in his prime. Then came the new leader. Nearly all the former ones had become leaders by the silent suffrage of their fellows and had sought to lead their own people alone and were usually, save Douglas, little known outside their race. But Booker T. Washington arose as essentially the leader, not of one race, but of two, a compromiser between the South, the North, and the Negro. Naturally, the Negroes resented at first bitterly, speaking of bitterness, signs of compromise which surrendered their civil and political rights, even though this was to be exchanged for larger chances of economic development. The rich and dominating North, however, was not only weary of the race problem, but was investing largely in Southern enterprises and welcomed any method of peaceful or cooperation. Thus, by national opinion, the Negroes began to recognize Mr. Washington's leadership and the voice of criticism was hushed. Mr. Washington represents the Negro in Negro thought, the old attitude of adjustment and submission, but adjustment at such a peculiar, oh, there's that word again, time as to make his program unique. This is an age of unusual economic development, and Mr. Washington's program naturally takes an economic cast, becoming a gospel of work and money to such an extent as apparently almost completely to overshadow the higher aims of life. By the way, he capitalizes work and capitalizes money. Only Marxists do that. Moreover, this is an age when the more advanced races are coming in closer contact with the less developed races, and the race feeling is therefore intensified, and Mr. Washington's program practically accepts the alleged inferiority of the Negro races. By the way, this is Darwinism. Again, in our own land, the reaction from the sentiment of wartime has given impetus to race prejudice against Negroes, and Mr. Washington withdraws many of the <clears throat> high demands of Negroes as men and American citizens. Um, in other periods of intensified prejudice, all the Negroes' tendency to self-assertion has been called forth. At this period, a policy of submission is advocated. In the history of nearly all other races and peoples, the doctrine preached at such crises has been that manly self-respect is worth more than lands and houses, and that people who voluntarily surrender such respect or cease striving for it are not worth civilizing. In answer to this, it has been claimed that the Negro can survive only through submission. Mr. Washington distinctly asks that Black people give up, at least for the present, three things. First, political power. Second, insistence on civil rights. And third, higher education of Negro youth. And concentrate all their energies on industrial education, the accumulation of wealth, and the conciliation of the South. This policy has been courageously and insistently advocated for over 15 years and has been triumphant for perhaps 10 years. As a result of this tender of the palm branch, what has been the return? In those years, there have occurred, one, the disenfranchisement of the Negro, two, the legal creation of a distinct status of civil inferiority for the Negro, uh, the steady withdrawal of aid from institutions for the higher training of the Negro. These movements are not, to be sure, direct results of Mr. Washington's teachings, but his propaganda has, without a shadow of a doubt, helped their speedier accomplishment the question then comes, is it possible and probable that nine millions of men can make effective progress in economic lines if they are deprived of political rights, made a servile caste, and allowed only the most meager chance for developing their exceptional men? If history and reason give any distinct answer to these questions, it is an emphatic no. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a minute. I'm going to push back on Dubois a little bit, and I'm going to push back on Rollo a little bit here. Uh yeah, you get them Eschilus. I'm sure that's going to solve everything, right, WB? If you, you want. Little, you get them a little Eschilus, get them a little Plato. I'm sure that'll straighten <laughs> everything right out. That's number one. Number two, there is a gospel of work. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. But W.E.B. Du Bois was captured by what, what Virginia Dalloway and the abolitionists, the second generation, ab, uh, second generation suffragists uh, who would eventually become the feminist movement were also captured by luxury ideas. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, the big luxury ideas that were at Harvard at the time that were beginning to infiltrate American uh, upper intellectual society and culture were the ideas of Darwinism, mm -hmm. the ideas of Nietzschean nihilism, 
Mm -hmm. and the idea, which of course some summarized in Nietzsche's often quoted but misunderstood phrase, God is dead, and we do not have enough water to wash the blood off of our hands. By the way, that's the back end of that quote. So Nietzschean nihilism. And then, of course, huh, the rise of Freudianism, all mm -hmm. coming out of Eastern Europe. I'm sorry, not Eastern Europe, Western Europe and Western intellectual thought, Western intellectual thought coming out of Germany and England at the time. Then, of course, you get that disaffected guy who couldn't get a job and hung out in a library in London for basically his entire adult life. Your friend and mine, Karl Marx, who was resentful, was bitter, and was looking for a reason he couldn't get a job. Dubois was captured by these luxury ideas, and you can read it in his writing. Now, Pache de Rolo Nixon here, I will forgive E.B. Dubois for run reason. I'll forgive him because those ideas hadn't yet been tested. Hmm. But hmm. I won't forgive anybody who, who postulates those ideas now in the year 2023, because those ideas have been tested. And somewhere around 300 million dead people in the 20th century proves that you got to break a lot of eggs to get around the gospel of work and money that's in the Bible. But they'll get it right next time. The next time it will be right. And then the next time, the next time. Right. They, the, 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 the new man will the, do the, it. The, the new man the will left, do it. Yes. <laughs> I am gesturing that it will continue. The left has the, the left alone has the luxury of always being able to employ the hortatory. And I just like how it sounds obscurist and obscurantist and whatever. But basically, the left can always talk about how it will be better. Right. They never have to demonstrate that it actually works. Conservatives like us, we have the other burden. They don't have a, the, 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 it gives wings to the left. We have a burden. Okay, right. well, show me it works. Right, we we can do that. But the fact that we're made to means that there's a double standard. Right. No. Well, well, and, and, and so now this, this now turns our corner into a full-throated discussion um, of, of reparations as we turn the corner here. So- <laughs> Um, oh, wait, 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 before we turn. Yeah. So, um, cause I followed where you were. He went over. Oh yeah. Du Bois went over what he would then emphasize later as this mm -hmm. chapter ended in terms of his own aims. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and at the time, 1903, there apparently were three, the right to vote, civic mm -hmm. equality, and the education of youth according to ability. Correct. I happen to agree with all those things. And so mm -hmm. for me, that's what puts me in his camp. I don't want to give up any one of those things, period. I enjoy, for example, with the third item, I enjoy things like universal school choice because I live in Arizona, not New York. I enjoy <laughs> universal school choice. I, I enjoy being able to use tax dollars to help fund non-state schools. Why do I enjoy that? Because I recognize what they're fighting against, mm -hmm. okay? They're fighting against this machine. And now it's not just a Marxist machine. It's a tech-driven Orwellian machine oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that is bent on destroying humanity. And therefore, if I have to use taxpayer dollars to fund its opposition, okay, I'm raising my hand. You can't see it. Okay, let's mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's the beast that we're fighting. And so I agree with Du Bois's aims as expressed in this uh, beautiful essay uh, against, you know, that, that was published to take a stand against what Washington was asserting. Now, of course, you read Washington's work, and I, I, I'm sure I've touched it at some point in my 44 years. I just don't know when. Uh, and it certainly wasn't recently. Um, I assume, because this is how any opinion piece works, right, which is all an essay is, is an opinion piece, um, that he's putting a spin on what Washington was asserting. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. absolutely. And yeah. so I, I remember reading that and smiling and saying, oh, what did Washington actually say? Because this is your take on it and you were against it. Fine. So we're in, in to effect reading Du Bois's quote propaganda, close quote, against Washington's so-called propaganda. Okay. Um, and so I, rec I recognize that. Now, um, the point where he said 
If history and reason give a distinct, any distinct answer to these questions, it is an emphatic no, that is true. Okay. That getting, um, well, so here, here's the issue. Okay. Um, the political rights gaining economic status helps and not just helps populists advocate for increased political enfranchisement, increased political rights. That has always been the route for that. Right. Yeah. With the exception of um, temporary mob rule by violence. That's the only other method. And no one's advocating that. Like, right. you don't have yeah, to no. talk to advocate that. It's no. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the only proven route that is sustainable, though, is, is that. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, um, yes, history, et cetera, you know, they give the emphatic no, but it's like, oh, OK, but th there's a relation between the two, you know. Right. And this is that whole for political rights when you can't feed yourself, you can't Correct. house right. your children. Come yes. on, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And of course, you know, to your credit, you said bring the two ideas together. Right. And, and they wouldn't. And it's just, you know, maybe they wouldn't because they were the poles, you know, and there's too well, much and, of a charge between the two, you know. Well, and, and, and again, there's there's something to be said for this idea that you brought up, that the reason there was too much charge between the two of them was bitterness. And I think it was, it was, huh. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I've already said a bunch of things I'm going to get in trouble for on this episode anyway. I don't care. I'm going to go for it. I think there was envy on the part of W.E.B. Dubois for not having the credibility chip of having gone through slavery and been born during that time mm. in a way that Booker T. Washington had that chip of credibility. Booker T. Washington can show up, could show up anywhere because he was actually born a slave mm. from the time he was born and was not freed until he was like 12, 13, 14 years old. Mm. And then had to struggle to learn to read and from struggling to learn to read, eventually wound up building an institution built on very solid principles. And by the way, he managed to get money that he talks about and support and funding from the white community in Tuskegee to build his institution. And by the way, there's an entire thing in up from, an entire section in up from slavery that talks about the making of brick. And he compares it to, and I'm going to talk about this with some reparations here in just a minute. He compares it to the brick making that was done by the Jews in Exodus. <laughs> wow. Right. The guy got it. Again, I'm a graduate from Bemidji State University. I didn't graduate from a fancy Ivy League school, but I can make bricks and I can make bricks of quality. But we also need to recognize that Booker T. Washington, to his point, was of a, or to his detriment, was of a generation earlier than, um, or almost a generation earlier than W.E.B. Du Bois. And so he might have held some, how can I put this, dismissal of the ideas of W.E.B. Du Bois because Mr. Du Bois didn't hold that ship. And none of Mr. Dubois' relations held that chip. They were freedmen. What we also miss, and we never often gets talked about in these discussions, is how there were racial class distinctions among between slaves and freedmen, and even between slaves themselves during the long and sordid history of slavery in the United States of America. There was a great book that I read a few years ago mm -hmm. about um about uh, not really secret societies, but a system of clubs that was built for what my grandma <laughs> back in the day would have called high yellow gals mm -hmm. um, and, and, and how that allowed individuals who were at that class level of wealth as freedmen in African-American culture to pass through white society in ways that people who look like me and Mr. Dorolo, mm -hmm. who a little bit darker on the spectrum, couldn't do. Mm -hmm. This creates distinctions. Mm -hmm. This creates differences. This mm -hmm. creates problems. By the way, Booker T. Washington even says at the beginning of Up From Slavery that his father might have been a white man, but he's not sure. I'm sure. R right. Race was tricky back then. And race is tricky now. And this is what makes the discussion 
And now we're going to go, uh, this is what makes the discussion around reparations so fraught. And uh, uh, it, to me, it's for me anyway, uh, for my opinion, just to be fully transparent here, it's a third rail. We don't want to touch it because I think it, I think it kills the Republic. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the, if not, if not the thing, along with debt and <laughs> printing too much money and every other freaking thing, uh, that's going to kill us sooner than any Chinese spy balloon. But I agree. It, but it's a it's a species of the same problem. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> um, yeah. It is absolutely. Rome, Rome had to deal with it itself with its empire, and so this American dominion over the fat part of North America um, will and is slowly, you know, what is the word? Um, it's a descent, okay? It's a descent into chaos and madness, but this is one of the routes, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a slow erosion, and if we're not careful, I, I, I firmly believe fundamentally in the next 15 years, if we all don't make the right decisions, this is why I'm doing this podcast, this is part of that right decisions piece. If we don't make the right decisions all the way down to the janitor on the street who thinks he has no power, mm -hmm. if we don't make the right decisions at every single level of our lives, we will lose the republic. Mm -hmm. From the New York yeah. Times, yep. from December of 2022, um, I'm going to read a, a couple of paragraphs here, and then I'm going to skip to what the boys in marketing would call the pull quote. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to make a point about reparations, and then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to open the floor to Mr. Nixon. In the two years from the New York Times, in the two years since nationwide social justice protests followed the murder of George, George Floyd, California has undertaken the nation's most sweeping effort yet to explore some concrete restitution to black citizens to address the enduring economic effects of slavery and racism. A nine member reparations task force has spent months traveling California to learn about the generational effects of racist policies and actions. The group formed by legislation signed by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2020 is scheduled to release a report to lawmakers in Sacramento next year outlining recommendations for state level reparations. And I quote, we are looking at reparations on a scale that is the largest since Reconstruction. Remember the Freedmen's Bureau? Mm -hmm. Said Jovan Scott Lewis, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, who is a member of the task force. While the creation of the task force is a bold first step, much remains unclear about whether lawmakers will ultimately throw their political weight behind reparations proposals that will require vast financial resources from the state. That is why we must put forward a robust plan with plenty of options, Dr. Lewis said. The effort parallels others on a local level in California and elsewhere to address the nation's stark racial disparities and a persistent wealth gap. The median wealth of black households in the United States is $24,100 compared to $188,200 for white households, according to the most recent Federal Reserve Board Survey of Consumer Finances. Let me skip a couple of lines and go to the poll quote. Californians eligible for reparations, the task force decided in March, would be the descendants of enslaved African-Americans or of, quote, a free Black person living in the United States prior to the end of the 19th century. Close quote. Nearly 6.5% of California residents, roughly 2.5 million, identify as Black or African-American. The panel is now considering how reparations should be distributed some favor tuition and housing grants, while others want direct cash payments. With an estimated compensation of around $569 billion or $223,200 per person. Now, just so we're all clear, I think this is institutionalized theft. This is robbing at a oh. governmental level. I, I was like, theft from whom? And then I clicked. Oh, no, this um, is institutionalized theft. Because where are they going to get the money from? They're not going to print it. It's California. They're going to rob Peter and give it all to African-American Paul. Yes. Um, and by, and the way, they're gonna rob, by the way, they're also going to rob. They're going to rob not just white Peter. If, for those of you who are listening in California, it's going to be Hispanic Peter. And quite frankly, because these are the people doing the best in California right now, Asian Peter. It's going to be Black Peter, too. That's the irony. Yep. Because they're not going to be able to exempt on the paying side anyone by race because that would be thrown out by the by federal courts. There you go. As offensive to the 14th Amendment, as it should be. 
Um, but what, what's interesting is it's it has no no one has learned from the indigenous example. No one has learned that when you stop doing your life and doing your livelihood, and I recognize that in order to continue it, they were fighting people in order mm -hmm. to do that. I get that. I understand mm -hmm. that for, for example, the Lakota to stand on their own two feet meant having to shoot at white people. I get that. I understand that. Um, but when you stop that activity and start taking the free cow meat and other products that are brought on a train, because the settlement of the West, the settlement in quotation marks of the great American West, Mm -hmm. One of the most powerful technologies was the railroad. It was a railroad. And because right. we live largely in America that doesn't realize its dependence on the railroad, it's just I feel that point is worth emphasizing. But basically, when when you, when you take that free stake, okay, you don't see what you're giving up. And there's people there are people at the time who recognize that and would talk about that, okay. Mm -hmm. And you can read their speeches and read some letters in which these ideas were discussed. They exist. Praise the Lord. They exist. You can you can find statements by several different indigenous Americans about these notions. But basically that lesson apparently is lost, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and in, in the intervening, you know, 150 years that lesson apparently was lost. And so here we are, 100 intervening, intervening 130, 140 years, excuse me, that lesson, you know, has been lost because now people are basically contemplating being placed in a reservation. Literally, you're giving up your freedom as an American, freedom to, okay. Um, I'm gonna quote somebody whose understanding of the constitution I would argue is still better than mine. Doesn't mean I agree with everything he said, okay? It just means that his understanding of the constitution was better. This is the eminent American jurist, John Marshall Harlan the first, okay? okay. Um, and this is from his dissent to the Plessy versus Ferguson decision, mm -hmm. which fr enfranchised on the federal level permanently. Among the things he said was a quote from, I believe it's a British case, but anyway, mm -hmm. personal liberty, it has been said, consists in the power of locomotion, of changing situation or removing one's person to whatsoever places one's own inclination may direct comma without imprisonment or restraint unless by due course of law period um that's what they would be giving up they're giving up that because if you need the voucher for this and you need this other benefit for that the government is controlling you mm -hmm. um, oh and by the way when it then comes time to vote who are you going to vote for oh well we know that they know this okay so, time to produce a reservation and so, so well, so here's at, at even a deeper level. Than, uh, yes, I, I, at a political level, at a legal level, 14th Amendment, even at a political moral level, which is what you're talking about, creating a reservation type attitude or a reservation type mentality. Um, again, looking at the work of the Freedmen's Bureau as described by W.E.B. Du Bois, this is merely an extension of that going further. And of course, because the currently well-educated and yet highly <clears throat> unintelligent people <laughs> at the University of California, Berkeley, who don't study history, are, of course, doomed to maybe not repeat it exactly right, but doomed to echo it. And it will wind up in the exact same spot that that thing wound up in previously because human nature hasn't changed since 1865. But there are two other points that I that I, I, I grind against with this proposal. Mm -hmm. The first one is, has anybody done a statistical analysis of how many billions, and it's gotta be billions, billions of dollars, black Americans who descended from slaves, let's keep it very narrow, that were held in the South, how many billions of dollars did they earn after 1865 now that they could be paid for their labor? From 1865 to now. Anybody done a statistical analysis on that? No. I know, I know one. You know it's one. It's, it's narrower. It's narrower? Yeah. Okay, it's narrower? Yeah. Okay. All right, that's fine. Then the second question that I have there, because I would assert that that billions of dollars of earning is the reparation. You've mm -hmm. been paid. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's my first assertion. My second assertion is this. In looking at, at the book of Exodus, which I was recently reading, uh, the Jews were in... in 
what the book of Exodus describes as hard bondage for 400 years. And yet even God himself, when he basically allowed the Jewish people to take from the Egyptian people, uh, I believe the Jewish term in Exodus indicated that he didn't allow them to take more than 10% of the Egyptians' gold and jewels. Now, if the Egyptian wanted to give extra, they were more than willing to do that. Uh, there, the Jews, of course, were more than willing to take that. And some of them did. You can see this in the book of Exodus. I believe this is in Exodus. Uh, like, uh, it's like it's right around the time of the last plague. So it's like eight or nine when they're getting ready to, when they're getting ready to bust out, right? God doesn't take more than 10%. And yet the government is going to take everything. Um, this comes down to, this is my objection. And, and by the way, this is not just the objection on reparations. This is the objection on federal deficit spending. This is the objection on the debt ceiling. This is the objection on, uh, on supply chain issues. This is the objection on, <laughs> speaking of railroads, railroad cars with chemicals blowing up on them, blowing up in, in like Ohio and no one reporting on it. Um, this is this is my objection with government getting involved with social media. This is my objection with government during COVID. Caesar is out of the box. And it's the job of leaders, because this is a leadership podcast, it is the job of leaders, black, white, yellow, or red, I don't care what color you come in, to make sure Caesar stays in the box. And just because you let Caesar out of the box because it helps you out, doesn't mean that Caesar isn't going to kill you or eat you or enslave you or, as God warned the Israelites many, many years after the Exodus through, uh, through the prophet Samuel about Saul, he will take your children and he will make them serve in wars and he will give you no repayment. But you want to have a king? You want to have a Caesar? You go right on ahead so you could be like other nations. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think, well, the kids used to say, they don't say it anymore, but I think we've lost the narrative on some things. And um, in particular, since this is, uh, we're focused really on African-Americans today, I think African-Americans have lost the narrative. And I mm. think that too mm. many folks in our, too many folks who happen to share my skin color and, uh, and, and by the way, who are running around popping their mouth off or writing things. Um, have drunk too deeply from that cup of bitterness mm -hmm. for absolutely no reason at all. And I believe part of that's probably self-serving um, and venal. Uh, well, they may have had a reason. It's just to me, even when you believe you have reasons to take that, to drink of that chalice or to borrow from the matrix, um, you're going to take one of those pills, right? The yeah. pill that, the pill of forgetfulness, right? Yeah. I'm not claiming there was no injustice. That injustice was not just magnificent and horrific and well attested to by foreign visitors, okay? Mm -hmm. Who yep. came to the United States and were in New York and reveling in all this accomplishment. And we're talking late 18th century, reveled in all this accomplishment of what you know people were able to do and the thrift and the industry and you know values you've touched on. And then cross the Mason-Dixon or what would later become the Mason-Dixon line and then began to get not just wind of, but began to see and experience and left horrified. Mm -hmm. There are multiple foreign visitors where that was their experience, you know, um, but it's just helping people recognize that drinking that chalice is a false step. It is not a step forward. Okay. It's a step through a trap door into a hell out of which you will not come. And it's just, you know, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to make them see, no, like your business doesn't get you anywhere, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, so it, it's painful, you know, it's painful because some of them I think do, good work and highlighting important issues. It's just, you know, then they, they go down the road, they go down and it's like, no, it's not going to get you anywhere that it didn't get, you know, pick, pick that it didn't get the Cubans, that it didn't get, you know, um, the Russians, that it didn't get the Ukrainians, you know, my wife's people. Um, it doesn't, you, you, there is no, 
I don't know. I wish I could quote from Orwell right now, but I haven't read Animal Farm and, and it's been too long. So, um, but th there is no socialist workers paradise. Okay. Like the socialist workers paradise is a reservation or a concentration camp. That's the sign above it. Okay. Yeah. And you just can't see it because yeah. like the matrix, that's not what they show you. They right. show you a paradise. That's the image that the tech will allow to go through VR and directly into your brain. No weird funky glasses and grandma's falling over because they got the glasses on. They'll be able to just send it into your brain. And that's what you'll see and experience. And it will not be your reality. Instead, you will be being harvested like a commodity of things that um, aren't life. It may even be biological, but it's not life. So back to something Du Bois said, um, that book just fell off the stack. Um, he talked about the higher aims, okay? Um, and I believe he was right in phrasing it that way. Praise the Lord found it. When Mr. Washington represents, Mr. Washington represents in Negro thought, the old attitude of adjustment and submission, but adjustment mm -hmm. at such a peculiar time as to make his program unique. This is an age of unusual economic development. And Mr. Washington's program naturally takes an economic cast, becoming a gospel of work, capital W, and money, capital N, to such an extent as apparently almost completely to overshadow the higher aims of life, period, close quote. There are higher aims to life. There are higher arts than mere labor. And um, those, they're, they're being dispensed with in our contemporary society. They're being dispensed with on, on basically on all fronts. And so what they will be replaced by is a brutal barbarian economic reality, unless we can get people to recognize, no, we're more than the sum of our parts. We are more than our mere biology. That is not what a human being is. And we all know this. We know this. There is eternity in our hearts. We know this. There's eternity in our hearts, and yet we cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. We all know this. And so when we then stand up, because we are creatures who always walked on two feet and never on four and never hunched over like that annoying bumper sticker, but we were created on our own two feet to stand on our own two feet and to stand manfully. That's why we're here. So um, that can be done. And in this country where you actually have freedom and have freedoms, this country where caste is for all intents and purposes a thing of the past, we must insist on people standing on their own two feet, men and women, and then engaging manfully and womanfully in these great struggles, because that's what it is. Again, you can have political equality with economic inequality, or you can have economic equality with no rights. Those are the two choices. That's it. Um, and so um, this is what we need to be about and need to be about. And this is, you know, what is this? How does the souls of black folk, um, what does it say with respect to leadership? What does it say about leadership? Okay. It itself as a work is just profound and it is leadership. It is a man who basically built his own stage, ironically or not with hands that probably couldn't build a stage, but built his own stage and then stood on it and then delivered this magnificent vision. And it's wonderful. Um, it's a wonderful historic work. This should be required reading in public schools. Um, and if private schools don't want to have it be a, a required reading, I'm okay with that. Because you're still going to have to come out of there with some sense in your head to be able to get a job. So I'm I, you want to do that, fine. I, 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 would pair, I would pair it with Up From Slavery. I would have them read both at the same time. And I'm fine. Well, I would want one than the other. But still, mm -hmm. I'm fine yeah. with reading that as well. It's just, uh, you know, that as well. But also, you know, the works I quoted from of Abraham mm -hmm. Lincoln, read that. Read Harlan's Descent. Read the whole Plessy decision, then read Harlan's yep. Descent. Yep. Um, read Huck Finn. But Huck Finn, but they're always right. They're always saying that word. Mm. But if you read Hemingway, you're going to come across it also, but it's not coming from the same place. Right, <laughs> it's right. Not said the same way, meaning the first of these guys, I think, understood my humanity, and the second guy didn't. Yeah. 
still a great writer. They both were. Um, and great writers in English and Westerners that need to be studied, period. Um, you're not going to be able to fight those ideas well without grounding in the same disciplines that these men had, period. It's not possible. So this gets this gets to then how I would like to close, which is first off by thanking Dorolo for coming on the podcast today. Always a vibrant conversation, intellectually stimulating from the two black guys. <laughs> One day we're gonna have to get we're gonna have to get two other black guys that I know to come on. We'll be, then we will call Drupal our black guy quota or, yes. or quintuple, uh, and uh, and it'll be uh, it'll be amazing. Or double. I don't know. It'll be some some mathematical thing will happen here. It'll be a doubling. <laughs> yes. But the impact um, will be greater than the sum of the parts. That's correct. Yeah. Um, mm. I'm going to say this, as I said in the episode that you should listen to before this, Up From Slavery, where I talk about Booker T. Washington's book. <laughs> and, 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 and yes, I will admit, it is propaganda. Um, he was a capitalist. He understood marketing. Um, he understood how to frame a story, but so was W.E.B. Dubois. He was a marketer too. He understood how to frame an argument and position it so that it would be the most effective that it could be. Mm -hmm. Both of these men were educated. Don't let them fool you. They were both educated. Mm -hmm. Um, one came out of chattel slavery. The other came out of chattel freedom. Which, for the 20th century, for Black History Month, a month that, as I admitted before, I tend to struggle with. Mm. I don't like Black History Month as a Black mm. man in America. Mm -hmm. um, I'm of the opinion that every month should be Black History Month. And let's just move along already. But some people can't get around it. Okay, mm -hmm. you can't get around it. Some people can't get past the bitterness and the anger and the desire for revenge and the envy that winds around their hearts like a snake. Okay. And some of those people are captured by luxury ideas like Marxism by other means, critical race this or social justice that, which is really just the great grandchildren of Marxism. So let's just call it what it is. Mm -hmm. there is no Marxist utopia and every time communism tries, it's, it, 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 it fails. Um, if you want to read something that'll really bake your noodle, go on to the, uh, <clears throat> the Marxist internet archive. Yes. The Marxists are on the internet, the Marxist internet archive and, uh, and upload or, or download and read W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, eulogy of Stalin, written March 16th, 1953, in the National Guardian. Which way will you go, Black American? Mm -hmm. Are you going to go in the direction of thrift and industry and character building? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to go in the direction of high intellect and envy and drinking from the chalice of bitterness? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to go in a third direction? where you try to take the best of one and the best of the other and slap them together. And I think most middle-class blacks, because very often the conversation is about the intellectuals in America, or it's about the poor people in America, but the middle-class blacks in America. And by the way, I define middle-class as anybody in this country who busts their butt and makes anywhere between $30,000 and $200,000. That's middle-class. Mm. Mm. These are the people who, like Rosa Parks before us, just wanted to get to work. You know, some of you may listen to this podcast, some of you may not. Some of you may be working in various city roles. Black people have always worked for the government. But some of you may be working in education. Some of you may be working in Hollywood. Some of you may be working in 
Well, some of you may be entrepreneurs. By the way, if you own a mechanic shop, you're an entrepreneur. If you run your own law firm, you're an entrepreneur. If you're a consultant, you're an entrepreneur. All of you are individuals first and members of a group collectively or otherwise about number 100 on that list. You're an individual to somebody. But the biggest person you should be an individual to is first yourself. You should be an individual to yourself. The thing for leaders to take from the work of W.E.B. Du Bois, the souls of black folk, is that while there has to be criticism, there does not have to be critical speech. And we live in an era of critical speech that is confused with criticism. Trolling, gaslighting, not understanding the argument not being able to get to the core of it. W.B. Du Bois didn't suffer from any of that. The man was an intellect in all the different ways that you would think of being an intellect, but he was also blind. Leaders, don't drink from the cup of bitterness. Don't be blinded by your own experience. Don't be crowded by your own envy. Let other people own the things that they are bringing to you. Why do you have to own their racism? And please don't talk to me about systems. Systems aren't racist. Human beings are. And the number of human beings you've probably run into in your life who are individually racist at an individual level, you could probably fit into a thimble. America is a country that over its long course of history, starting in 1776, not 1619, has driven mightily to become a more perfect union, led by men such as W.B. Du Bois urged into action by men such as Booker T. Washington, and of course, inspired by the writing of such leaders as President Lincoln. We've had a wide-ranging conversation today on the podcast, and there's something here for everybody. But leaders, the big thing here for you is this. You have to choose a direction. So choose wisely. I believe there was a Templar night in Last Crusade that said that to Indiana Jones. That's all I have for today. You got anything else to roll up? Sure. Quote, this is the end of, of that third essay in that eminent work. Quote, by every civilized and peaceful method, we should probably stop there, right? Civilized and peaceful. And to me, you can then draw a line to what MLK was doing. Mm -hmm. right um with a reference obviously to what gandhi did anyway uh, by every civilized and peaceful method we must strive for the rights which the world accords to men clinging unwaveringly to those great words which the sons of the fathers would fain forget we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so from my perspective, be about the pursuit. Life, liberty, and happiness, be about the pursuit. And please buy a house and make your mortgage payments on time. Because all of a sudden that wealth gap boop, starts to get much narrower. It's literally an entire asset class where you can just track that metric only and the light bulb goes off. Um, and the, the stir, it gets to a disturbing level. So I, I do believe in racist systems. Not that I believe that the system should be that way, but that they exist, okay? The really simple examples, the Raj in India, that was a racist system. If you were a Hindu, here was the limit. That was it, that was all. Uh, Jim Crow was a racist system. There were limits and there was behavior. And when you stepped out of line, you might end up dead. And it was systematic. Um, it didn't care about the individual and his aspirations and what he was trying to do. And thus it wasn't American, yet it was so American. Anyway, um, be about the, be about the pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and buy a house. Stop tripping, just buy a house. Buy a house, buy a house. Start building those practical steps outlined by people like Mr. Washington. Work, 
period. But without those higher aims, um, you don't know what the direction in which you're tending. He, there was a line I read today in another one of those essays that just struck me. Um, it's in uh, the meaning of progress. Quote, the 10 years that follow youth, comma, the years when first the realization comes that life is leading somewhere, close quote. One of my frustrations, it's when men refuse to recognize life is leading somewhere. One of my frustrations is when women refuse to recognize that life is leading somewhere. We are now in living in societies with collective amnesia and people are not aware that life is leading somewhere, both individually in terms of families and on a societal level. And so people who buy houses recognize that life is leading somewhere. They recognize that they're always going to need a roof over the head, so they might as well own it. It's simple. And so my frustration is with people with their talk and rhetoric, but they ain't going to buy a house. And they don't really have an explanation for why that adds up to make economic sense or C-E-N-T-S, sense. It doesn't. And so for me, uh, let's be about that. Let's be about that. Um, I, I, I know I've quoted him before. I'm going to quote that great American philosopher, the godfather of soul, James Brown. The way I like it is the way it is. <laughs> I got mine. Don't worry about his. Dorolo Nixon is out. Listen and subscribe to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast on all the major podcast players that you listen to podcasts on, including iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and even Spotify. And please leave a five-star review if you like the show. We need those reviews to grow, and it's the easiest way to make sure that this show gets into the ears of the leaders who need to hear it. And of course, tell all your friends. If you want to get started on the leadership path, HSCT Publishing's products and services can help your team do that. Check out our training webinars, coaching services, and more at leadershiptoolbox.us. We also have a video-based subscription service, that's software as a service, that can help your team become better at the individual level. 60 modules and over 100 hours of video and written content for you at leadingkeys.com. That's leadingkeys.com. We've also got books that will help you and your team grow. Pick up a copy today of My Boss Doesn't Care, 100 Essays on Disrupting Your Workplace by Disrupting Your Boss, and subscribe to the Little Red Podcast I launched earlier this year with the same name as that Little Red Book. My most recent book is 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership, Co-written with contributions from Bradley Madigan, this is the book for right now that was written for leaders right now. Pick up a copy by heading over to 12rulesleadersbook.com backslash now. That's 12rulesleadersbook.com backslash now. You pay for shipping and you'll get a copy of my second book as well. Finally, you can get all these books in paperback, hardcover, or as ebooks on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, and any other place online you order books. Finally, HSCT Publishing is on YouTube. Like and subscribe to the video version of the Leadership Lessons for the Great Books podcast on the HSCT Publishing channel on YouTube. Just search for HSCT Publishing and hit the subscribe button. You'll get our weekly video updates, which is the video version of this podcast. And, of course, you're going to want to subscribe to my other podcast. That's right, I do do more than one. The Hayson Sorrells Presents Audio Experience, where I talk more casually with a broader range of people about all matters that matter in the world today, from arts all the way to analytics. All right, that's it for me.